Hi everyone, welcome to Chat. I'm Sarah Falcon, the Director of UX Strategy at Wiley. We're talking about the practical realities of integrating AI into research responsibly. And today we have with us Avi Stamen. Yeah, hi. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm Avi Stamen, uh, CEO and Managing Director of Academic Language Experts, an author services company that helps researchers with their publications and grant proposals. One of the big things I heard when I was working with researchers is a lot of them aren't sure how to confidently and competently use these tools. And they really want to understand, are there certain questions they should be asking themselves or a basic framework they should be using when they're considering how best to use AI in their work? And I'd love to hear your opinion or any experience that you have on that topic. In order to answer that question, we need to understand or come up with a idea of how these tools work as opposed to maybe other tools that we're used to working with. When I do my trainings, my first point of emphasis is always stop looking at it as a technological tool and think about it like an artist, right? So I like to think about AI as much more of a creative tool. Um, in fact, it's right, we're, we're, we're really talking about generative AI. So it's, it's generating something new. That new entity is not always going to be right or wrong, but it's going to be creative. Um, when it comes to these generative tools, I would recommend actually considering thinking about using them as brainstorming tools. In terms of specific things that we can do to kind of check and you know make sure we're using them responsibly, number one is I think we need to think about whether or not we have the ability to uh, do oversight, to do fact checking on the answers that we're getting. Question two that I ask myself is what is the risk profile of this particular use case that I'm doing? Have any guidance or best practices that you could share with researchers to help ensure that they are working together transparently and that they can learn and grow from each other and their use of AI in their work? So I think it starts and finishes with creating a, an environment whereby it's not taboo to use these tools. Um, and, 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 it's, and here's the irony. The irony is, and I'm sure you've seen this in the data that you've collected, I mean, we're talking about adoption rates, you know, above 50% in, in many different use cases within a very short period of time, which is kind of unprecedented. I mean, if you look at any research tools, it usually takes years, if not decades. Every single uh, publisher that I've seen r requires or highly recommends transparency in use of AI tools. But the researchers need to be convinced 100% that when they are transparent about that usage, it is not going to be used as a point against them. I think we're still at the point where there's this kind of hush-hush, like, I know you're using it, you know I'm using it, but we're just not going to talk about it. It's a little bit of an elephant in the room. So we were just talking about this idea that reviewers and editors, they see all these negative use cases for AI. But what are the emerging red flags of AI misuse reviewers should watch for? I think as an industry, we have a tendency to want to write guidelines. Whatever, like new challenge we come across. We're like, all right, we got to make policy around this. What we need to do is we actually need to educate. And that's one of the reasons that I, the, the, the guidelines that Wiley put out put a smile on my face because I felt like it wasn't going directly to, here is a list of the 10 things you may do, or here's the list of the 10 things you may not do, because that's ineffective. Rather, I actually think that if we go back to basics, which is what makes good science, and then ask the question, does this tool hinder or help us getting to that goal of good science, then I think it will empower researchers to be able to take those principles and say, okay, I know how to apply this. I love that. And I love that you're the first part where you talked about, it's still about the science. So how would you um, advise a researcher to understand more about the difference between even something like an LLM versus a, a tool that has, let's say, access to a database? Um, I think it's important to understand um, two different approaches uh, to generative artificial intelligence and why it's so critical to be picking the right ones in the right circumstances. There's a whole other category of tool, which are called RAG tools, right? Or the RAG technology, which is RAG is short for Retrieval Augmented Generation, which works in a very different way. And I think it's a really critical distinction. First of all, they're not pulling from the entire internet. They are pulling from very specific data sources. So in many use cases for researchers specifically, be sure to ask yourself before you start using a tool, is this a 
general frontier LLM, okay, large language model, or is this a rag tool which pulls from a very specific uh, science kind of database? So for example, I know that Wiley recently, um, uh, I believe signed a contract with Perplexity. When, when it all kind of comes together, you will be able to search on Perplexity. And if you're a Wiley customer, as far as I understand, you'll be able to actually get answers from all the Wiley content as well. And that's what I think is the future of research for scientists or the future of AI for scientists for that matter, is this ability to really use the power, the computing power of being able to process billions of pages in, almost instantly, but actually have that give me curated scientific answers with references, right? But once that kind of becomes perfected, we're talking about shortening timelines for let's say doing literature reviews, especially systematic reviews from weeks and months to hours and days. I love this idea of matching the use case to the tool. How would you recommend people learn about these tools? There's a website, um, for example, that's called There's an AI for That, where it's an AI to help you find AI tools. So when you, you you're thinking, yeah, no, it's great. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you're like, I wonder if there's an AI tool, you actually type in There's an AI for That, you type it, you know, you'll search it and it will try and find an AI tool. So that, I like that. That, that. That's one of my favorites. Um, the other thing I would highly recommend because we're talking between researchers today is uh, Ithaca um, has actually put out, uh, they are doing a product tracker. So they actually are following all of the AI tools that are for either research or higher education, anything that is going to help researchers do their jobs better. What should researchers be disclosing about their use of AI tools and their methods? I think it's really important for editors to keep an open mind, okay, when they do receive papers, especially not punish people for being transparent and doing what we're asking them to do. On the other hand, if there's a case where you think it's being used for a very critical part of the research process, and um, as an editor, you don't feel as if you have the tools in your own, you know, your own knowledge um, to verify, check, you know, reproduce, uh, that's a conversation that needs to be had either with your editorial you know, uh, colleagues or with the researcher themselves, right? You turn around to the researcher and say, listen, I'd like for you to provide a little bit more background and understanding justification and documentation for what you've done so that I can better understand why you chose to use this tool and how you used it. Do you have advice for researchers on best practices for prompting? So how you prompt definitely makes a difference for the outputs that you get. So there's two things that I recommend. Number one is detail oriented. What do we, what needs to happen first? What needs to happen second? What needs to happen third? Think about if you were to do this process in the traditional way and you'd have to write it out. The second tip that I would say is context, context, context. So what I mean by that is the more that you are directing it towards the sources that are constructive and helpful to it, um, the better it will be. Uh, if I just ask it to write it on its own without giving it any details or context, It'll write something very generic. However, if I give it some previous papers that I've written, or maybe the draft of the paper that I'm currently writing, you will see a much, much, much improved abstract in terms of language, in terms of accuracy, in terms of quality. So be detailed with your prompts. Pretend like you're writing a manual, all right, for your student, and then give it context. Give it as much examples. I think that's really excellent advice. Thank you, Avi. Do you have any advice for this upcoming generation of, of early career researchers on how they can balance learning about how to use AI in their work and then also developing their own core skills, their own voice, and their own direction in their field? So my primary concern for, you know, kind of early career researchers or even, you know, graduate students um, is not around adoption of tools, just the opposite. I think that they'll, right, they'll be native to the tools. It'll be easy for them. But actually, the biggest kind of risk that I see for that, for, for the next generation of scientists, is um, actually what everyone's doing, which is summaries. I think that there is a kind of natural temptation, even for those of us who are very disciplined and want to do science right, to say, there are so many papers that are out there. There's so much to read that I'm just going to use these summaries, especially if the summaries are pretty good, right? I am very concerned that we are going to rely so heavily on kind of the truncated or uh, shortened version of whatever it is that I'm concerned that we are going to be in a post paper generation um, where we're just relying too heavily on summaries. And then what's going to happen is, is without that proper nuance and understanding of the rationale behind which tool was used to perform the experiment, if that kind of gets washed away, 
then I think we're going to end up with a shallower, less um, deep science, which is quite risky. I think that's a very responsible uh, <laughs> uh, way to answer that question. They help us understand maybe even what we want to dig into further, but the digging in further is where the real knowledge and I would say the expertise maybe even might come from in both understanding writing, but also the field. And I've heard from a lot of researchers as well that sometimes reading a paper, they find things they didn't even know they were looking for. One of the things, we talked about disclosure earlier, and one of the things that I've been doing personally to help me, because I'm very worried about that as well, is when I do things with AI, I write up a disclosure afterwards sometimes to see, am I comfortable with my role versus the AI's role? And do I feel like I really contributed and led that or did I let the AI lead it? And you only have to do that a few times before you can figure out where is that mix where you really feel like you are still intellectually the leader and that you're not taking the lead. Um, and I think that is a practice that I would also throw in there as a recommendation to try and just see where is that balance for you? And to be aware, like, I think that awareness is so smart. How do you think AI is going to transform the scientific practice? That's a very broad question. So don't outsource that, right? You yes. Keep on writing, right? Mm -hmm. We will, believe me, if you love writing and you have a, a penchant for writing, we will see that as readers. We will, we will appreciate and love you for it because you're not going to sound like the rest of AI. And if you can't stand writing, but you just want to get back to the lab, and you know, double and triple check your work, and do another experiment, and you know, and 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 replicate your findings just to make sure it's true. Great. So then use the AI to you know to to help you with the, the you know the 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 verbiage and the language which you can't stand, and get back to those to to what makes you a researcher and gives you passion. Right. What's the passion point you have? And then use AI to do all the stuff that's not that right. To do all that stuff that distracts or stops you. What's the bottleneck? Use the AI to clear out the bottleneck. Don't use the AI to replace your own passion. I love that. And um, you're, you're actually, you're, you're speaking to the choir here. Like that's a design thinking principle. You start with the user and you start with the need and then you, you, you adapt the, the technology to the user. And I, I actually give a similar advice to people, which is write down all your, your, your to do's. And then within those, uh, put the tasks that are in there. And then any of those tasks that you procrastinate on, is it low risk? If yeah. so, see if AI can do it. So I do a lot of qualitative research and I have colleagues, we have very different parts of the qualitative process that we like. We're going to outsource different things and have AI help us or support us in different areas because we're different people to your point. Like some of yeah. us love yeah. writing, some of us don't. <laughs> um, and so I just even think thinking it's a personal thing, right? It's a, it's, it's make AI personal, right? Make it work for you. Exactly. Um, well, Avi, this has been really fascinating. Um, I, could talk to you forever. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure to have you. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, how should they, how should they contact you? It's Avi Stamen. Um, you're welcome to search me. Um, I will be happy to accept your friend requests uh, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue and the conversation. Watch more chats next.